morning everyone i know it's been a late night and uh, a very early morning start but this is a very exciting uh, area which we are going to be talking on allographs is the future and i'll tell you when you talk to surgeons across the country there's a huge paucity on the information available on allographs every center wants to use allographs but they don't know where to procure it from what is the procedure how do you store it what are the paperwork necessary clearances which you need. So this is going to be a, a mixed pot too, really. We've got our surgeons talking to us about the usage of allographs. We've got Dr. Astrid. She's going to enlighten us about the whole process of starting a tissue bank. Many questions for her towards the end. So I'm not going to waste time. I'm not going to introduce each speaker. As soon as one speaker finishes, we'll get the next one to talk because we're going to pack in a lot in this session. So without wasting any time, we're going to kick off with uh, Dr. Astrid. She was in charge at uh, Tata, and now she's going to be talking about this new project she's taken on as well, but that's over coffee. But first, let's listen to her. And then we've got another talk from the MTF, which is uh, the Muscular uh, Skeletal Tissue Bank in the United States. So that's a recorded talk. And then we've got Dr. Raja from Ganga Hospital. His is also a recorded talk because he had to head back. But otherwise, we've got all the speakers here. And our chairpersons here are Dr. Vivek and Dr. Akshay. So we'll start off with Dr. Astrid Kam. Hello, good morning everybody. And uh, I'm happy to see that we do have some people here in the audience. I was afraid we'd have an empty hall. <laughs> um, so um, thank you to the organizers of YROC 2022 for giving me this opportunity to speak at this symposium. Uh, globally, tissue banking has been in existence um, since the 1940s. Notable among the early banks was the uh, U.S. Navy Tissue Bank at the Naval Hospital, which was established in 1949 by Dr. George Hyatt, and the Tissue Bank at the University Hospital in the Czech Republic, which was established by Dr. Rudolf Klen. Uh, you can see that, um, you know, the numbers of tissue banks uh, rose exponentially in the U.S. Uh, in one of their reports in 2001, the Department of Health and Human Services identified 150 tissue establishments, and they also admitted that there were obviously many more which uh, had not yet come under their scanner. Now, in India, unfortunately, because of the lack of regulations, or rather the inadequate regulations, by and large, tissue banking was conducted very much like a cottage industry. Uh, you know, I know you're all familiar with the fact that many surgeons just store the femoral heads and directly use them in patients. Um, yes, they do the blood tests, but they do not close the zero diagnostic window for HIV. Uh, there were also attempts to sterilize or preserve the bone in various ways. So, you know, things like boiling, autoclaving, even 0.5% uh, formalin have been used, and uh, ethylene oxide for sterilization. Um, I started India's first tissue bank in 1988 at the Tata Memorial Hospital. And this was part of a project of the International Atomic Energy Agency where they wanted to use atomic energy for peaceful purposes. And in this case, it was for the radiation sterilization of biological tissues. Uh, earlier this year, we registered uh, one more tissue bank which can supply musculoskeletal tissues. And this is the Novo Tissue Bank and Research Center, which is situated at Santa Cruz in Mumbai, and which I am now associated with. Uh, I'm happy to say that in 2011, the laws in India were amended, and because of this, now all tissue banks have to be registered with the Directorate of Health Services. And this is a good thing, because when you have a registered tissue bank, you know that uh, you know the skilled personnel is there, equipment is there, and you can maintain uh, standards which have been prescribed. Now, the sources of tissues could be either living donors, you're all familiar with that, surgical residues, femoral heads, tibial cuts, uh, tissues from amputated limbs, and deceased donors, which could be either the organ donors, or you could also have any death is actually an occasion for potential donation. The kind of bones you have are minerals, bo mineralized bones, frozen or freeze-dried. Sometimes we also do acid-treated, so you get demineralized bone matrix, and here, at least in Mumbai, all of them are sterilized using gamma radiation. So what is the goal of a tissue bank? The goal is basically to provide tissues on demand, tissues that are immunologically safe, will not transmit disease, and most important, will have a predictable function. So the challenge is always to keep the balance, like what do we do to make the graft sterile and non-immunogenic, at the same time not destroy the biologic and biomechanical properties. 
So usually most banks will do have a number of cleansing processes. Uh, aseptic te uh, techniques will be used. Preservation by either freeze drying or freezing at minus 80, and then packaging and terminal sterilization with gamma radiation. Now usually we have um, the gamma radiation we use is dose of 25 kilogray, and this gives you a sterility assurance level of 10 raised to the power of minus six. What do we mean by that? We mean that the probability of finding an unsterile object after irradiation is one in a million. Now, uh, freeze-dried tissues, how do you store it? You store them at room temperature, so it's very convenient. Uh, before using, you may need to rehydrate it, but that's a decision that the surgeon has to take. Uh, usually for tendons, ligaments, we recommend that they be rehydrated prior to use. You can rehydrate it using simple saline or Ringer's lactate solution. And obviously, you have to completely immerse the tissue in the solution. Some do's and don'ts. For tissues that have to be cut, shaped, drilled, or used for weight-bearing purposes, excessive force should not be applied to the lyophilized bone. Uh, antibiotics may or may not be used. That depends upon the surgeon. If you're using them, you have to check for the patient's uh, sensitivity to antibiotics. And the concentration of antibiotics should normally be less than what you would use for an IV administration. And of course, once the container is opened, then either the tissue should be transplanted or discarded. You cannot reuse it. For as frozen bone is concerned, the frozen bone, you have to thaw it. Uh, once again, you can use uh, saline or ring lactate solution. And here again, the choice of whether to use an antibiotic or not is dependent on the surgeon. Once the bone is thawed, it has to be either used, implanted, or discarded. Um, OK, again, I said antibiotics can or cannot be used. Now, freeze drying has a lot of advantages. It reduces the antigenicity of the graft. It preserves the tissue, which has, gives it a shelf life of uh, three years, which is really good. And it enables in convenient storage and transport. Uh, radiation sterilization also is very convenient. And the main thing here is the high penetration power because uh, the grafts can then be radiated in the packet state and can be used immediately after radiation. Uh, we send our graphs to BRIT, uh, which is a division of the Department of Atomic Energy. Uh, it's important to remember, you know, many people think that you can use any graft and sterilize, I mean, send it for radiation, it'll be sterile. Not true. Okay, so you have to have, the graft has to have uh, less than 1,000 CFU per graft before you send it for radiation. So a heavily contaminated graft will not be guaranteed that it would be sterile. So that's why the bio burden is important. And we progressively, part of the processing in a tissue bank is to progressively reduce this bio burden, the various ways in which we do it. Um, and among these are, of course, the aseptic techniques. Most important, of course, is donor screening. Okay, the doses can vary. Sorry, do I have a minute? Okay, the doses can vary. So um, if the bio burden is low, you can use a lower dose, okay? And this is good. Uh, but if you are looking at viral inactivation, then you have to use higher doses. And this, of course, affects the graph. So uh, again, stressing, donor screening, essential. Now, both gamma radiation and freeze drying will reduce the mechanical strength of the bone. However, if this bone is irradiated in dry ice at temperatures below minus 40 degrees, then it is possible to preserve the mechanical properties of freeze-dried irradiated bone allografts. So my final message to you is how do you choose your allograph? Because of its brittleness, freeze-dried irradiated bone should not be used for weight bearing or screw placement. It's better suited for impaction bone grafting or morselized and used as fillers. For weight bearing, it's best to use frozen bone irradiated at temperatures below minus 40 degrees. Thank you so much. So, so we'll take questions at the end. We won't waste time. We've now got this talk uh, which has uh, come in from the United States. So MTF is the musculotuber foundation which is in the United States and we've got uh, Mr. Real to talk to us, he's one of the senior executives, to talk to us about what they think of the tissue banks in the United States. So while he's just loading, any burning questions for Dr. Astrid? Well, we just got that uh, video ready. Yeah. I would like to ask. Uh, we have uh, greetings from New yeah. Sorry, okay, we are we are on again. We'll do it at the end of the Present at your conference. Sorry, I can't be there with you live, but hopefully you will derive some benefit from this recorded presentation. I'll provide some info contact information for you at the end if you have 
additional questions. My name is Michael Real, and I'm the Vice President of Procurement at a nonprofit organization known as MTF Biologics. MTF Biologics is one of the world's largest tissue banks and celebrated its 35th anniversary in 2022. During that time, we've processed tissue from more than 150,000 donors and have distributed more than 10 million allografts for transplantation. And there's a couple of things that we've learned during that time that I'd like to share with you today. Number one is that with the proper screening, testing, and processing, allografts are safe for use in your patients. We have an impeccable track record at MTF with zero viral transmissions and no donor-derived bacterial infections in more than 10 million allografts. Patients are not going to be put at risk. Their chance plant of allografts that go through the proper processes. The second thing that we've learned in more than 35 years is that allografts provide excellent surgical solutions for many of your patients' needs. With more than 1.2 million allografts transplanted every year in the United States and more worldwide, we know that they are viable options for surgical patients in both the plastics and reconstructive world, wound care, and of course, what we're here talk, to talk about today, which is in orthopedics. And you're gonna hear more about this from your colleagues during the rest of this session. What I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about the types of offerings that tissue banks may make available for orthopedic procedures and the types of patients that they're gonna benefit. So let's start with really how MTF started, which is the use of grafts um, to replace bone that is lost due to cancer. We were started by orthopedic oncologists in more than 35 years ago, and has helped young patients like Dylan here, who's seven years old, has a massive osteosarcoma in her proximal humerus. We're able to provide a donated intercalary humeral allograft for her that is put in place with a humeral head prosthetic and gives young Dylan not only not an amputation, which could have otherwise been her treatment option, but a functional limb and allows her to go back playing sports and just playing with her sisters and her friends. We can also see the use of large grafts to help with bone loss due to trauma. Here we have 40-year-old Christopher who took a gunshot wound to the distal femur and to the knee joint itself. Um, typically, not only would we utilize prosthetics potentially to replace the bone loss, um, but then also as part of a hemiarthroplasty. But at 40 years old, Christopher's fairly young to have a joint replacement surgery and the inevitable need for a revision. So we provide an osteoarticular graft, which not only provides the bone that's lost due to trauma, but preserved osteoarticular cartilage so that we can replace the joint surface as well. And Christopher doesn't have need for such an early revision arthroplasty. We also know that there's other damage due to trauma that may come about that could utilize allografts from the repair. And that's for athletes um, that undergo, especially knee injuries, torn ACLs, maybe PCLs, collaterals, or even massive meniscal damage that may require allografts for replacement. And with the ACL repair using allografts, we see almost 100,000 procedures occurring annually. So then we know that they're a good option. And we utilize grafts that have bone blocks in them. Here you have soft tissue grafts from the patellar tendon, the quadriceps tendon, the Achilles tendon that have bone blocks to aid with fixation. Or there's a lot of other uses, it, a lot of other tissues that don't necessarily have the bone blocks utilize other fixation methods, including the hamstring tendons and some of the tendons from the lower leg as well. All of these can be utilized as a replacement here we see for the ACL with the proper fixation. I know you're going to hear a little bit more about this um, later in the session as well. And then we also see a lot of use in allografts in assistance with spinal fusion procedures where there's been discectomies and you can use large structural grafts 
um, to restore the disc height, to replace the disc itself, to aid in fusion, as well as morselized grafts that can be utilized to assist with the fusion as well. And so we see these either traditional structural grafts, like iliac crest wedges and tibial shafts, or maybe even more um, advanced machined allografts that can be utilized as spacers. And then of course, the wide variety of the non-structural morselized grafts would help with the fusion procedure itself. So a lot of different options that are available. These are just some examples of the graphs that could be available to you through your bone banks for a safe and effective use in helping your patients through their surgical procedures and their recoveries. Um, but before I go, I would be remiss not to mention the front end of the process and the people that really make this all possible. Because if it weren't for the donors and either them making difficult decisions before they pass away to become a donor or their loved ones having to make that decision at the very difficult time when they're still grieving their loved one to donate their loved one's tissues. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't have these biological gifts to make them available to these patients for their treatment options. And that's why donors and donor families are our heroes because without them, we wouldn't be here at all. So just want everybody to remember them as part of this process. Remember when we're implanting their loved one's tissues that they are likely still grieving that loss, but they get benefit from it as well. So thank you for your time today. If you need additional information and want additional information, please feel free to visit our website at mtfbiologics.org send me an email at realm at mtf.org or feel free to talk to any of your tissue bank colleagues that may be there at the conference there i'm sure they'd be able and willing to answer many of your questions about what type of tissues are available um, for use for you so thank you very much thank you once again for having me enjoy the rest of the session and enjoy the rest of the conference So, you know, 154 tissue banks registered in the United States. I think we are still in a single digits here in India. Next talk, Manish Agarwal. He needs no introduction. A dear friend and my senior colleague from KEM. Fabulous work, what they've been doing at Tata. We're going to get a glimpse into his life. Good morning for all of you who are interested in allografts, which I know is a small number of people. But I'm going to share with you what we've learned over 20 years. Uh, we all know that we use allografts because we don't have uh, either a suitable autograft, especially long bones, when you look at it, you, where, where do you find a replacement for a femur or a tibia? You can find something in the fibula or the ribs or something. but. Uh, most of the times in tumor defects, it's the long bones and, and we would need allografts or uh, we, we have to reconstruct with metal. Uh, in children, particularly even taking autographs uh, can leave significant morbidity, particularly if the defect is large and that's where the allografts are very useful and that's how our use of allografts started. We have to also understand that you heard about allografts being used in the West. They are fresh, frozen allografts. So while allografts can give us interesting solutions, we don't have a cadaver donation program yet in India. And that's the reason we don't get bone from cadavers. So where do I get my long bone struts? The only option is from our own amputated limbs. And these amputations come from tumor patients. And there has been a big mental block in using graft from somebody who has had cancer before. But these grafts in sar from sarcoma patients are safe because today we use a lot of extracorporeal radiation and reimplantation. So what we do is take the good bone from that amputated limb. For example, suppose it's a proximal tibia for which an above knee amputation has been done. You can use the distal femur. You can use the fibula because these patients have already been screened for disease and we know that these bones are not diseased. So 
when you look at the results of allografts, you have to evaluate it in this context that ours are always radiated allografts and the results of radiated allografts are going to be very different from the results that you get with fresh frozen allografts. So you cannot compare and therefore you have to understand where you can use the allografts well and where the results will not be good. So let's go into different kinds of defects to understand where the allografts would work very well. So the commonest defects which any orthopedic surgeon would be faced are generally post curettage defects or what we call as contained defects where there's a good shell of vascularized bone around into which or the cavity of the bone into which you would place a graft and that's where the commonest use of the allograft is. Uh, the other defects which you know are sometimes a hemicortical allograft where you don't remove the whole circumference. And the most difficult defects are the full segment defects. Now, whether they are joint involving or whether they are intercalary defects does not matter when we use the allografts because the principles of incorporation are generally the same. And they are the most difficult defects to reconstruct as well. So contained defects are never an issue. We all know that uh, we've used morselized graft we can't get too much from the ilac crest or the sources that we have. So whenever you need a larger quantity of graft, you would mix it with an allograft. You can add bone marrow to it and uh, you can use these and these generally work well. They do have the risk of getting some amount of resorption. And that's why when you're using a large quantity of morselized graft, you have to be a little careful. Something like this, where here we've been lucky that the whole thing has got resorbed. But now, for defects like this, we would use structural grafts like the fibulae or, or the long bone grafts. Now, in giant cell tumors, we commonly use what is called as a T-construct, where you can use struts both on the subchondral side as well as you can use struts on the longitudinal area to fill in. You don't have to fill up the entire cavity. You just need to fill, put in graft to keep that cavity uh, from collapsing. So this is an example of a young patient who had multiply recurrent giant cell tumor who was actually sent for a resection. But because he was young, he was active, we decided to go ahead and reconstruct him with allograft fibula and an autograft iliac crest, as you can see here. And he is about 13, 14 years now from his surgery. And you can see that there was hardly any bone before and now his bone stock we could restore with this and he's got uh, good enough function to be able to play badminton. So biological reconstruction is something which all orthopedic surgeons would like to do and allografts would help us with that. This is a five-year-old boy who had a big uh, unicameral bone cyst or a simple bone cyst and you can see here again there is no bone stock. You don't have suitable autograft where you can use. So here we have used an allograft tibia inside that cyst to help uh, reconstruct and rest restore that bone stock. And you can see over time, we've removed the implants now and his bone has got uh, restored anatomically. Similarly, this is a girl who had a very bad fibrous dysplasia with a shepherd crook deformity with her, uh, uh, the fibrous dysplasia coming back again and again. And finally, in this case also, we had to use a big tibial allograft which you can see inside to fill in that shaft and her fibular autograft in the neck to be able to do a decent reconstruction and restore her bone stock. Hemicortical defects are defects like this generally for a surface tumor like a parosteal osteosarcoma you could reconstruct them. So this is an example of an osteosarcoma. So instead of doing a prosthesis and a full resection, you, you remove only that part of the circumference on which the tumor is and then you, you can use an allograft to uh, reconstruct the defect back. And you can get a biological reconstruction with, uh, ex as you can expect, a very good uh, function. Now, full segment allografts are more difficult, like I said. And with the freeze-dried, the union was a big problem. Then we shifted to frozen grafts. And even with them, you will see, like from here, for there are times when you don't know whether the graft has healed. You've grafted them. You get union, but again, after a few years, they break. So they undergo a fatigue failure, and therefore, the functional results are not durable. So if you look at our data, only 40% healed with primary surgery, which is not good. We now, therefore, actually combine these full segment uh, allografts with a vascularized fibula. So even when you're doing an arthrodesis, it always fails if you don't combine it with a vascularized fibula. 
what the vascularized fibula does is to give you vascularity and change the way the allograft behaves. So you get the strength of the allograft and you get the vascularity from the fibula. This construct always heals. We've never had to graft it. And uh, it is robust and it's, it lasts a lifetime. So this is an example of a 26 centimeter femoral defect which has been reconstructed with an allograft with a vascularized fibula. And you can see that this patient could then go on to become normal. She could get married, she has two girls, and she can actually lead a normal life, which would have been difficult without. This is a large giant cell tumor where we were going to do an arthrodesis. There was skin loss, but the neurovascular bundle was intact. So again, an allograft with a vascularized fibula, and this went on to an uneventful healing. With alloprosthetic composite, uh, results are very variable with these radiated grafts. Some of them will heal, some of them don't, some of them get resorbed. So we don't usually use them unless we are faced with a very difficult situation like this five-year-old girl. Uh, very long segment, so we initially removed uh, uh, the part of bone which was good, radiated it and put it back, what we call as extracorporeal radiation and reimplantation. But that failed in this girl and then the only option was to use an allograft to now reconstruct back and use that same expandable prosthesis. And you can see over a period of time that this has now worked for this particular patient. So the take home message now is that if you can, if you use allografts, you should know which ones to use. If you're using long segment allografts, longer than 15 centimeters, we should combine them with a vascularized fibula. And once you know which allograft to use, I think the results can be pretty good. So thank you. Okay, so thank you, Manish. Uh, we've now got Dr. Raja, who was here yesterday, but he had to fly back uh, to Ganga Hospital, but he's going to join us on Zoom. So we'll get him uh, via the Zoom link, and he's going to talk to us about his experience with allografts. Uh, they, too, have a, a bone storage facility at Ganga Hospital, he told me, and they are using a lot of allografts for arthroplasty reconstruction. Uh, good morning. I'm sorry, I'm not able to join you uh, physically. I have to come back. So can you play the video I have given? Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Danshegar Raja, consultant orthoplasty surgeon at Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore. I'm going to talk to you about the role of allograft in orthoplasty. So Ganga Hospital Tissue Bank was started in 2008 with technical assistance from Tissue Bank at Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. We follow the same processing technique at Tata Memorial Hospital, which is a validated technique. It's a self-funded non-profit tissue bank. We follow International Atomic Energy Agency standards and use gamma radiation for sterilization of the bone. In orthoplasty, the most common role is in revision hip and knee orthoplasty periprosthetic fracture and extensor mechanism reconstruction. 15 years back, we used a lot of Muller rings and Bushnader cages combined with cancellous graft and structural grafts. Now we are moving away from these uh, rings and cages and using more of uncemented fixation with tantalum augments. The role of cancellous allograft still remains. So this is a patient with solitary myeloma proximal femur, THR then failed in 10 years as a young and active patient. A stable reconstruction done with impaction bone drafting protected with the Miller ring. 10 years follow up, we can see excellent bone reconstitution. This is a massive stabular bone loss, uncemented uh, THR, Charlie type of THR. The defect reconstructed, there's a titanium mesh on the floor of the socket preventing the graft from seeping into the pelvis. Impaction bone drafting technique protected with the cage with good long term follow up. The post-septic sequelae with absent posterior column reconstructed with figure of seven graft, a stabler fixation protected with the cage and good reconstruction of the hip. Posterior column intraoperative bone loss reconstructed with fibula stud graft with plating, impaction bone rafting protected with the cage with good long-term follow-up. 
Our series has been reported in Indian Journal of Orthopedics with good medium and long term follow up. Now we are using more of uncemented socket fixation, contained defect reconstructed with cancellous graft, uncontained defect reconstructed with tantalum augments. As a massive osteolysis both on the femoral and establer side, uncontained defect. We can see that reconstruction with tantalum augments and impaction bone drafting, uncemented socket reconstruction. Trochander also reconstructed with chunks of cancellous bone fixed with tension band wire. The immediate post-operative x-ray, patient is walking full weight bearing with good abductor power at end of two years. Complete loss of posterior column in a young patient, reconstructed with a posterior column buttress augment, impaction bone drafting, good reconstruction of the socket, restoration of the center of rotation of the hip and good functional outcome. Coming to femoral revisions, always two-stage revision leads to a lot of bone loss both in the socket side and the femoral side. So on the femoral side, we need to reconstruct the proximal femur to retain the abductor mechanism and also to prevent breakage of these rigid stems. So we use a long cortical stud graft to reconstruct the proximal femur. This is a young patient, 30-year-old female, pathological subtrochantric fracture. Biopsy came as a benign tumor, so first fixation failed, second fixation failed, and third fixation attempted, presented to us with proximal femur bone loss, more than four centimeters shortening. So we had to reconstruct the proximal femur with unsymmetric stem and a four centimeter tibial graft, circumferential graft, trochanter reattached with a plate. This is a two years follow up. You can see excellent growth uh, graft integration and the restoration of the abductor function. Sickle cell anemia, where there is no medullary canal, intraoperatively I had to use a lot of uh, medullary reaming, which led to thermal necrosis, and patient being a squatter, didn't allow osteointegration, so he presented to me like this. There is not much of distal fixation option available, very difficult to get a distal fixation with a long stem. So we used the impaction bone grafting technique, the calcar reconstructed with a mesh, Diaphysis reconstructed with impaction bone drafting technique in 2016. 2017, he returned to normal activities. 18, this is a six and a half years follow up. We can see excellent uh, reconstitution of the proximal femur bone, both the calcar and the uh, uh, proximal femur. So, where there is poor distal fixation options, impaction bone drafting is very useful. Coming to periprosthetic fracture, elderly patient fractures around the tip. You combine a locking plate with the anterior stud graft. The stability of the construct improves. You can see the anterior uh, stud graft plating. The combined fixation leads to good union. Coming to revision TKR, we can use cancel of graft, chunk of cancellous graft to reconstruct the condyles, massive osteolysis, condyle reconstruction with cancellous graft, supplemented with diaphysal fixation so that the bone is reconstituted and we don't rely only on the diaphysal fixation. Similarly, lateral condyle reconstructed with impaction bone draft technique with the titanium mesh with good outcome. Massive defect more than 6 cm, reconstruction with a 3 by 3 into 3 femoral condyle sexual graft, additional fixation with the diaphysal uh, fixation stem and full wedge augments. But nowadays we are moving away from uh, cancellous graft in uh, TKR, we are using more of metaphysal sleeves and tantalum augments. So this is extensor mechanism deficiency, patellar tendon loss post TKR, reconstruction attempted with a semi tendinosis graft. You can see the patella alta, left side is unable to extend. Reconstruction done with the bone tendon bone and the tendo Achilles graft. The patella has to be brought down with a VY plasty, PTB graft fixed to the patella and the tibial tuberosity. Additional reconstruction with the aloe graft, the post operative x ray. Range of movement gradually started after two months, partial weight bearing after three months and full weight bearing after six months. This is a further follow-up. You can see the position of the patella is maintained. The extensor uh, mechanism has been reconstructed. Patient regained the active extension. So the allografts play a major role in arthroplasty where there is no bone available for reconstruction. So they will continue to play a major role in arthroplasty. Thank you for the opportunity. Right, so that was Dr. Raja from Ganga Hospital.
We now have uh, Dr. Prasad here, who's going to talk to us, a young dynamic uh, arthroscopic surgeon practicing at SIFI and at several centers. He's going to talk to us about his experience with allografts in sports medicine. Good morning and thank you. So uh, I'll just start because we have less time now. So when you talk about sports medicine, we are talking about all these intricate tissues uh, between the bones, which is very important for an optimum function of any joint. And in case of an injury, we can have, in case of injury of these ligaments, this can be a nightmare or a career ending for any elite sportsman. So let's talk about, when we talk about arthroscopy, we are basically doing three procedures for any torn injured ligament. We are doing either a repair, we are doing a reconstruction, or we are doing replacement. Uh, repair is not pertinent over here, but we will talk about what is reconstruction and replacement of these tissues, which is important for this subject. So we'll talk about reconstruction. Reconstruction has always remained a mainstay of treatment for reconstruction of cruciates, collaterals, cartilage, and multiple tendon injuries. And we know that autograft is a gold standard, easily available uh, graft for these uh, injuries. But as we know, as we start doing more and more work, we face often face situations like failed ligament reconstructions. We have patients who have got a multi-ligament knee injuries, and sometimes our primary graft may fail due to surgical errors. So what do we do? Let's consider start with this case number one, where we started harvesting the graft, and we had a premature amputation of the graft, and, and some cases we get a very small graft. In these cases, we know if we use a smaller graft, the graft is eventually going to fail. So this is what we did for this patient. We had a premature amputation. We used the patient's other hamstring tendon, and we added that with the graft which, uh, which was available uh, from the, uh, the cadaver. And that's what we did. We made the graft which was six millimeters to nine millimeters diameter, and we kept the allograft inside, and we kept the, the patients on autograft outside for a good biological healing. So this is a good bailout situation can be used for any premature graft amputation or if you want to increase the graft thickness if you have a facing a situation of a smaller tendon. Let's consider the case number two, where we have a patient, patient with who has got a multi-ligament reconstruction. This patient had both ACL as well as MCL. For the ACL, we used patient's own autograft and for the MCL, uh, we used uh, the patient's, uh, for, the, for the MCL, we used the allograft. Certain centers are recommending this techniques as a primary choice of technique where we combined injuries, the cruciates are, we are using autografts, and for the collaterals, for the medial lateral side, allograft is used as a primary technique. But due to unavailability of grafts, we are still using allografts adding to graft donor morbidity. Case number three, moving out of knee joint, going to the ankle. If you see this patient who has got a six to seven centimeters loss of tendoachillus, and the the technique for this is a reconstruction using the autografts from the nearby tendons, and the Campbell itself is confused what tendon to use. So there is no standard single technique. There is non-physiological ways of immobilizing post-operative, and we also have the donor issues. We can turn, for, we can look for allografts in these cases, which is a very simple technique. This has come from the local bank over here in Mumbai, and this is what we have done. Uh, so we have used this tendon, we have prepared it, and we have made a transosseous uh, tunnel in the calcaneum and passed the graft on the healthier part of the tendoachillus proximally. And this is your immediate post-operative, and that's your. If you see, immediately you start getting the Thompson's test, a good continuity of the graft. This patient is just two months post-operative, but now has started walking quite well. We all know the advantages of the allograft and the autograft. Uh, the, that's not important. Now, do, do, so we did some study where do allografts work, and we also looked in this paper that how does the autograft or the allograft heal separately? And we had some questions from the patients and from the surgeons also, and that we found that the pain, the, the pain factor in allograft and autograft was more or less same. The recovery period for the allografts in ACL was slightly more, so it's about 20-30% more was the recovery period, and stability was also about 20% less as compared to the autografts. So that's the nutshell, where they found that allografts take a little longer time to heal, 
and they're little more less stable compared to the allografts, uh, to the autografts in ACL group of patients. But that same study also talked about that if you do the ligament reconstruction using an allografts for an extra articular ligaments, in this case, the posterior telofibular ligament, they found that the ligament was much more stable and the recovery was actually better. Similar studies was for the ulna collateral ligament reconstruction. So the message what we get from this is that allografts are inferior to autografts in primary ACL reconstruction view of stability and recovery. However, they are the preferred grafts for revision cases and allografts works very well for an extra articular ligament reconstruction considering various properties. Looking at the reconstruction, we start going some other cases where the autografts are not available. Example, a patient who has got a post meniscectomy, patients with irreparable cuff tears or large osteochondral defects where the autographs are not available and we look the op only option is the replacement and these are the cases only allografts are available. So let's, let's look for this case number one where the knee is a post meniscectomy knee in a young patient and then we have nothing to do with this patient. Either this patient lives with an end stage osteoarthritis and opts for a replacement at an earlier age or this patient can be opted a, a meniscal transplant surgery at an earlier age for to preserve his knee function. So that's the middle meniscus and that's the, uh, the, the transplantation. Case number, two, case number two for the replacement. If you see this patient over here, this patient has got a large medial femoral condyle osteochondral defect and non-standard techniques like oats or any ECI is going to work for this. And this patient we did way back in our KEM days and uh, this is what we did a large uh, allograft over here and fixed with Herbert's screw. This patient made for a complete recovery in about two years. Case number three, uh, massive rotator cuff tears. These are tears which are irreducible tears and these patients have got a tendon atrophy. So there's a loss of tendon mass, young, fairly young patients, 50-55, no arthritis, cannot opt reverse shoulder for these patients. If you see this patient has got a large tear and it is not right to do any kind of replacement procedure for this, then we can use a, a superior capsular reconstruction. So for this patient, we used a xenograft because we still don't have permission. This is imported from US, xenograft. We still don't have permission to use human, uh, import human uh, allografts. We use a xenograft and that's what it is there. So we got a good tendon reconstruction using the, uh, the superior capsular reconstruction over here. So the take-home messages, Allografts have significant role in ligament reconstruction. It can be used as an augmentation or a primary graft for the extra article ligament reconstruction and it is the only biological available tissue for certain pathologies and we should definitely create more awareness of tissue donation. Thank you. Right, so that was Dr. Prasad. So now towards the last talk, we've got Dr. Vaibhavya. He's going to talk to us about the future of allografts. Where are we heading now? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Dr. Parag. So, from what can be applied to what can potentially be done to improve this, this talk moves more on what's the future and what we expect as a surgeon to be doing in the field of uh, allograft. It's loading the presentation. So, yes, so, Prasad, excellent talk while well, it loads. And I, I would also tell when I was researching for this that almost 26% of primary ACL today are done with allograft in US and around 64% of revision. So that's where we are heading. And I think in India, the numbers are far, far, far less. I don't think it's only 24 or 64 also might be a, a big number for us city. Now the other talk, number seven. No. Webhub, number seven. That's all. So the enthusiasm for allograft I can see from the room is increasing compared to what we used to have in past. Uh, so a sh quick show of hand, how many of you have used allograft in past? Wow, so that's a good number, so almost 60%. So I think that's a good number. And uh, you'll see allograft for all written here. 
I don't mean to mislead people by saying that we should use allograft in all cases. What I mean is that allograft should be available to the right indications. So thank you once again. Uh, one thing that I've learned over years is that as is our biology, is so is our orthopedics, of course, with a little help from biomechanics. This is the Mona Lisa slide for all of us in orthopedics. We know that any healing or any reconstruction will happen with all these three things. If we have osseo genic potential, if you have osteoconductive potential, mm -hmm. and osteoinductive potential. And the allograft fills uh, a gap here. Of, I mean, see, if you look at the gold standard, it's always the autograft. But the allograft fills in a gap. But it's an incomplete gap. We know that the allograft is dead tissue, and that's why this talk. By itself, it has no meaning. Unless it is enhanced, unless we complete the all trilogy or quadrology, the allograft has no meaning, and the, hence this talk. How can we enhance the allograft? The apprehension about the allograft use comes from this fact that when it's not used in the right way, it is useless. So we all must know that we need three things, whether it's allograft as a bone or as a soft tissue. Unless we have all the three together, the orchestra will not play. So we, then we started doing our experimentation. We started using allograft with bone marrow, and today I firmly believe that this is how the allograft should be used. We should have BMP, we should have the allograft, and we should have marrow. If only all the three are maintained, that you can give a consistent long-term result with this. Otherwise, we'll have one-off case reports saying that the allografts work. So that's the way. And once it's done, and this can also be used, I use it for a lot of my AVN cases, and you'll see we use osteochondral plug. They are wrapped around in the BMP sponge, and the marrow is added. If you have all the three, you actually mimic what is a live fibula with all the three potentials here. And I think once we have got enough number of our AVN cases, fortunately, unfortunately both, COVID has given a lot of AVN cases, so a lot of learning for us, and we'll see how the results play out in the next five years. So they almost look like allograft nowadays once we mix this. This is how we use the cancellous graft. And for all intercalary, I think Dr. Manish gave excellent slide in which we said how to use it. And I think for all segmental or contained defect, I think the way forward is allograft. I have no doubt in saying and no hesitation in saying that. But how do we look beyond? How can we improve the quality of allografts? And can we add value? And that's what this talk is about. I think ma'am has said enough and every speaker has reiterated it. Preserving osteoinductivity is the key thing. Right handling of tissue, right duration, right exposure, right preservation, and right indication. If we do all that, that is how we go beyond. Enhancing safety is the number one concern. We cannot go to a use of allograft unless we are sure that they are safe. Enhancing quality, these are the three pictures and we know, must know where we are using it. One is trabecular cancellous bone, the other is the cortico cancellous, and the third is the dense cancellous bone. The first one is a given. The third one is where we have to go over the years. A quick word about different allografts used, and you'll see they are the different strengths. So we must know which allograft has to be used. So it may not be necessary that for a bone patellar bone defect, we are using a bone patellar bone graft. We use sometimes a TA for that, and that's essential. So we have to dig deeper into what has to be used. You have to use right things for right indication. That's one of the key messages from this. We must know the donor profile. We, good bones make good thing. Alendronate given grafts. So a lot of time we send grafts, and the studies are coming up in which the allograft treated neck femur fractures, if we are using those grafts, they do not have good incorporation. So science is evolving and we must dig deeper. Sterilization impacts and must question how they've been sterilized, whether they are appropriate for the thing that we are using. Similarly, the preservation effect is also important. Irradiation, again, is very important and key to the strength. But I think this word, I really like it, the word the fertilized, and I call it pran pratishta. For anything that you do, I think that's how you enhance the graft. You have to fertilize it. You have to fertilize it with biological science. I think that's where it is moving. That's where the science is moving, to understand it more. More and more, we'll see the other thing that we are doing is adding to or augmenting the strength. So two things, adding to the biology and adding to the biomechanics. I think that's where the allograft should be moved for a wider uh, use in the field. This is how I think the future of any ligament reconstruction will be. And as I said, the other thing that this talk is adding value. How can we make them not just an inert objects? If you are not adding value, we are just taking it away. And I think one of the key things that these allograft can also do or how we can enhance that is by adding antibiotic uh, to these things. It could be variety of antibiotic. We all know about the MICs, but I think the key concept is MIBCs, which is the minimum inhibitory 
का फिल्म कॉन्सेंट्रेशन दैट इज द एबिलिटी टू अचीव अ कॉन्सेंट्रेशन ऑफ एंटीबायोटिक लोकली एट दैट लेवल एंड आई थिंक वेन यू आर यूजिंग एलोग्राफ इट गिव्स वंडरफुल अपॉर्चुनिटी इट्स जस्ट नॉट सिंपली मिक्सिंग द एंटीबायोटिक लाइक वी डू इन सीमेंट बट मॉडर्न टेक्निक लाइक आइंटोफोरोसिस इवन दी हनी जिलिंग सो देर लॉट ऑफ साइंस दैट इज गोइंग बियॉन्ड दिस टॉक इज जस्ट टू गिव ग्लिम्स इन टू द फ्यूचर दैट द फ्यूचर एलोग्राफ्स विल डिलीवर हाई कॉन्सेंट्रेशन ऑफ एंटीबायोटिक्स इन दिस लॉट ऑफ दीज आर कमिंग एंड you'll see that there are a lot of in vitro in vivo studies animal studies which are showing how the antibiotic deliveries will be there these are the antibiotic grafts available used all across the world but the most exciting thing is the ability to add adjuncts so i think that will be the game changer when we can add bmps when we can add vegf we can add tgf we can enhance i think anything that we implant in body if you look at sessions today we talk about smart implants smart sensor i think it's an opportunity whenever you are violating a person's body to enhance things and i think that's where allograft or any implant thing will move last but not least i think innovation starts at our own rooms this is i think rajesh akhar uh, dhanesh akhar raja has said so many things and i think nowadays we use lot of bmp stem cells and the allograft together to reconstruct these are follow ups long term follow up and they work they really work and last but not least i would all encourage you to take the plunge i think we are far too short in number of allografts available number of the bone banks that are available level to us we have published a paper on how to do it there are many people in the room who are my colleagues and it all starts from a seed and i think i would encourage the people from all across the cities different cities that there should be bone banks and we should use more and more to enhance the science and uh, we need to make our existing graft better safer stronger biocompatible is the key we are looking in, in this key arena and there is there are scope to do much more and early success with lot of adjuncts in place as i said no allograft talk can be complete without thanking the donors and encouraging people to donate as a surgical residue we all are potential donors and potential people who can enhance the field so thank you for your attention and uh, i hope to over the mic to you Okay, so we've had this uh, session here now. It's about 9:20. Those who want to attend the supra condylar session, they are most welcome to go up and join in the main hall. Since we are here, we have the luxury of uh, discussing further. So I'm going to take this liberty and have another 10 minutes of discussion. It's very difficult to get this faculty together. So let's take some questions from the audience for our speakers here. Yeah. Uh, good morning. uh i just wanted to ask that uh we have a lot of patients coming with amputations road traffic accidents and having amputations but uh, there is a lot of potential contamination because of the nature of the injury so can these be used as uh, or is there a way of preserving these or utilizing them because if you have an below knee amputation probably the ankle and the foot might uh, still not be contaminated so is okay. there a way of using so, those for Okay, so we'll uh, Dr. Astrid, you want to take that? Yeah. yeah. So his question is: If you have an amputated limb, there is partial contamination. The patient has come in, but the ankle and the foot looks reasonably clean. And after this washout and the debris, ma, are we safe to harvest the ankle and the foot as and store it for future use? It correct? Yes. Yes. So you can do the dissection, and uh, yeah, th the main thing is that it has to be clean, so it has to be non-contaminated. and if you can ensure that then yes very definitely you can use the tissues from the amputated limb and you do the normal donor screening uh, and uh, that in fact is what they were doing at tata hospital with the amputated limbs which were there for uh, no uh, so there is a difference here it's uh, at that one time yeah so the difference was that our amputated uh, graft was taken in sterile condition whereas here you have something which is road contaminated so i since we take only the bone i think you have to look at how much is the contamination and whether you have any tissue envelope a soft tissue envelope on the bone now if your bone is not directly exposed to the contamination then you could use the bone but if the bone is exposed and contaminated with road side which in india is full of uh, bacteria then i don't think that's a suitable so what you need to crop. also Yes. So you should take cultures at the time when you are taking the bone. No. So, so what we do is uh, we can store. See, even if you don't have a bone bank, you can have a refrigerator. 
So you have, you can, you, if you have a minus 80 freezer, which most hospitals now are keeping as a bone store, like the femoral heads, the knee wedges after uh, knee replacements, and these amputated struts, we keep them till the time the tissue bank, like the Tata Bank or the NTB Bank, can come and take it from us. So you can store these at minus 80 very safely. Okay. Question. Yeah. One sec. Yeah. The gentleman at the back. Yeah. Good morning. Few questions. Uh, question number one to Dr. Raja. What could be the length of your uh, allograft bone which you use for the femoral side? Do you use it to re uh, reconstruct the lateral uh, column, the lateral uh, uh, cortex of the femur? One. Yeah. And uh, one more question to uh, Prasad. What would be your uh, strength of your soft tissue uh, have you ever analyzed what would be your post-operative, uh, if you use an ACL with an allograph, what would be your stiffness? And what would be, have you ever encountered any infection post-operative or a knee stiffness or whether the strength purely alone vis-a-vis -vis compared to an autograft of the ACL? And last question to Vaibhav, how would a composite with a bone a BMP with an allograft, with a suture tape, would it really replace a autograft, a, a real ACL? So these are questions which come to mind. As the same thing as bones are irradiated, how are the soft tissue sterilized? The soft tissue, the tendons, is it also irradiated? Because as soon as you irradiate, the, ten, the proprioceptor cells of the soft tissue element tendons will go away, I guess so. So these are questions which come straight from, you know, the listening to all the panelists today. Okay, so we'll start with Dr. Raja. Can you hear us, Dr. Raja? <coughs> Thank so, you. I, I'm able to hear the uh, question. So the question was uh, whether you used a, a long cortical stud graft to reconstruct the lateral column. So it is uh, uh, used uh, mainly to con uh, have the lateral column continuity with the abductor attachment. That's one thing. Second thing to do, replace the lost bone. So if you have a circumferential loss, we use a, a whole circumferential graft. It's only the one cortex loss, then we use only a, a long stud graft. So it depends on the extent of bone loss. But primarily, uh, most of the time we see lateral column uh, discontinuity and abductor uh, detachment. And uh, previously we were using cobalt chrome stems, the solution stems, where uh, you need to reconstruct the proximal femur, otherwise it will break. But now the use of, with the use of uh, titanium stems, the breakage of the implants is almost uh, nil. So we can leave a little bit of uh, uh, bone gap, which automatically reforms with the periosteum intact. But in, uh, post-tumor resections and major loss after infection, uh, we try to keep a long uh, cortical stud graft. The length can be anything. So sometimes we are using even 15 centimeter graft like uh, Dr. Manish Agarwal uh, shown. So uh, it is uh, primarily to replace the lost bone so that you have a good uh, uh, bone in the for future revisions, especially in young patients. So have you ever encountered any fracture of that gra uh, cortical graft? No, uh, because we are using a stem, additional stem to uh, fix. It's a rigid fixation and the stem is supporting your graft doesn't uh, break. Okay. Uh, compared to what we do in the reconstruction of tumors where these uh, stress fractures are very common in the uh, allograft. Here for joint replacement, uh, it does not happen because the joint itself supports the graft. Okay. And one more uh, uh, um, point regarding the amputation limbs. So if the patient comes within that six hours of a window where you can reconstruct the uh, 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 limb and do a vascular anastomosis, but the limb is not fit for uh, replantation. The vessels are too much damaged, the limb is totally crushed and patient reaches within that six hours of stipulated time those are the limbs we can take for uh, using for allograft. Beyond six to eight hours where already the uh, decomposition has set in, we don't use it. So that is one thing you need to keep in mind. Already the putrefaction process has started, it cannot be used. When the patient reaches to you within six hours, then you preserve it, remove all the contaminated bone, you disarticulate one joint double, uh, preserve the rest of the uh, limb which is can be used for all this uh, uh, graft harvesting. If you are not immediately able to go there, you can keep it in a deep freezer and take it out and dissect it later. Okay, okay. Next question. So, uh, Dr. Prasad, that was his question to you. What is the strength you were seeing of the 
very quickly if you want to answer him. Do you feel it's the same? Or is so, it so it is, we discussed that the stiffness and stability was 20% less. But what we can do, we add the diameter to the allograft. So that covers up for that. Strength. And what do you feel about the tensile strength? So we discussed that one of the slide, it is 20% less. 20% less. Okay, next question. Yeah. <clears throat> Sir, what is the medical legal liability of the grafts uh, which we use not from the bone banks, which we do it from our own setups where we freeze dried it at 60 or 80 degrees? So uh, if any complication or the infection of these things happen, so are we like, what is the medical legal liability in this courses? Just wanted to have from all the panelists, maybe Dr. Agrawal, yes. Sir. So mm -hmm. now with these new regulations, I don't know how it is affecting what we call as these bone stores, which individual hospitals or uh, surgeons have keeping the, say, a fresh femoral head in the fridge and then using it. And like you said that the window period for HIV has not been covered in that we don't do a second blood test. So is there a liability? What happens if somebody gets an infection and then sues that hospital or doctor? According to the new law, it's mandatory, mandatory for the banks to be registered with your health services, okay? okay. And there is a penalty involved which goes into lax if you are not registered. And it covers everything from, from retrieval right up to processing, storage, distribution. So if you're doing any, even if you're doing any one of those things, you still have to be registered. So that's there. And as far as the legal aspect is concerned, it would be like with any implant or anything, that would be, the, that would be from the insurance point of view and the, uh, you know, liability. But definitely uh, from the law, yes. It's not correct. Liable. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Dr. Weber? Yes, you wanted to add. Are you taking special consent? Like, uh, but but consent that consent will not be valid if the things is, thing uh, is yes. not medically valid. There, is, there is, is a consent from the donor. That is also important that they are donating that tissue. The problem which is coming is because you have to maintain records of the blood tests. You know, there has to be a traceability. Every tissue bank has a certain traceability. If there has been a problem with a the graph, they can go back and check whether there has been a break in any of those processes in that chain and then correct that. But if you have just a femoral head stored and then you're just using it, there is absolutely no traceability. So here the liability will come. And even when you go by NABH rules, which now most hospitals are affiliated, we are not yeah. allowed yes. to do this as a part of the NABH. So even in our hospital, we only keep the bone as a temporary store till the time it goes back to a proper tissue bank, gets processed. And after that, when it comes back, I don't think you have a problem on that. So actually, the law is much more stringent even than that. In yeah. fact, what he's doing is also illegal by law, by ICMR guidelines. Yeah. Any product that is taken out of the operating room, even if you're, it's your own, if a bone marrow, if you take a bone marrow, you move out of the operating room and come back in, it's illegal. Yeah. It's illegal. PRP done outside the room is you will need to take a special consent. Anything that goes in the body, when you're operating, if bone graft goes out of it's your own bone graft, because they say what happens outside that room is beyond, it can be changed, it can be this. That's why so much stricter regulation for the, for the uh, bone bank, uh, for the blood banks, okay? So anything that moves out of that room is then considered it's gone out of the process. So in fact, the newer regulation says that even the PRP machine that you're doing has to be in that operating room. If it is outside, you have moved that sample out of that room and there is a potential that there may be any other people here is illegal. And you can be actually, you can lose a license for it. So any, even your own product cannot move out of the operating room. That's how the stringent the regulations are today. But with bone this, so, no, so, so no, your bone. No, Weber, don't, don't, yeah. uh, this is your confusing. Yeah. I'm talking of a bone store where, yeah. see, you, wait, if illegal. you use the tissue back, it's then illegal. it is illegal. Using the tissue back is illegal. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So okay. anything that goes on cannot yes. come back in. That's what I'm saying. What I'm saying, but storing the bone to that's send okay. it to a tissue bank is fine. No, that that's is okay. Yes. That, that too is anything. We are doing biopsies and everything. So that's what I'm coming to. Yeah, that's, yeah. Even for the same patient, you cannot reuse it. The, that's the, the moment something is taken out of the operating mm -hmm. room, it, it becomes a tissue. Tissue. It, is, yes, it exactly. has become a tissue and then it is subject to, to all, all the, the rules of organ donation. All the regulations. That, that is machine why the machine PRP machines have brought into the, the operating, operating room. Theater. That is my point. Yeah. That you can, if you are giving away, it's okay. Once it's gone away, if you are getting in, in, that's the regulation. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, so in a nutshell, there are a lot of surgeons who are storing tibial shavings and the heads in this storage container and then they are using it. Effectively, it's not on. We it's are. Not legal. It's not legal, so we can be dragged to the court of law. Yeah, uh, Sangeet, your question? The bulk is a cartilage which we take off and we are left with a very little cancellous bone which is actually usable. So uh, what do we do with that cartilaginous part of the graft? Uh, are you all using it to increase the bulk of a graft when you have a larger defects or you just throw them? Or is there any other way by which even that can be used? So what is Dr. Astrid's take on this? No, so Cartilage is never going to incorporate, yeah. so cartilage is thrown away. So if I'm going to use it as a morselized graft, I will take off that cartilage and use only the cancellous part. So typically it's a wedge where one side is thicker, the other side is thinner and you will get some graft. The TKR wedges are never great for a volume of graft. The femoral head is the best thing to use if you have a volume of graft. But again somebody had asked if you want to use it for structural support, where you're going to put in a block and you're expecting that to be loaded. For example, you're doing a calcar reconstruction or something. Then you should use the frozen radiated rather than freeze dried because freeze dried does not have the strength. It's only good for, as a morselized graft for impaction graft. Yeah. So even at Bombay Hospital, we have, we used to call it the bone bank, but now we use it as a bone storehouse. None of us use the cartilage. So we take off only the cancellous uh, bits of it and then that is discarded. As he rightly said, that does not incorporate. You are tempted to use it in order to get more volume and you'll mill it, but even then that is not going to help you. Yeah, just, Vivek, few, yeah. Yeah, just, just few questions for the elite panelists and out here. How, when we are procuring and retrieving that bone, how do you prepare it? We have talked that we can do it when we are from the donor side, when you are doing it in sterile conditions, is there a specific protocol which you need to follow? that you need to put it into betadine, into saline, into a process, or you just in the sterile process take it. And as for the femoral head, as we said that the cartilage is not required, do you want to shave it out right there at that time? Or you want to put it into the bone banks and when you are going to incorporate it into a recipient, at that time you want to remove the cartilage also. So doing this on the operating table is very difficult. Like you said, even a arthroplasty surgeon does not have the time that he can process the graft later on. I mean, you do the surgery and it is over. If you're doing it later, then again, if you're doing it in sterile conditions, removing the cartilage, you'll require tools, you'll require sterile conditions. It's a theater cost and uh, nobody does it. That's why you just keep the femoral head, you pack it, you actually have to triple pack it. Like you said, you don't have to put it in any saline or anything. You clean whatever blood, and the marrow you can as much as you can, maybe with a pulse lavage, and then you just triple pack it and send it for processing. As she said, the bio burden, I think, is something you have to take care of. So we do all the, we do all the cleaning in the tissue bank, okay? And just the raw bone is sent to us. We give sterile containers for that. So it's collected in that. And then in the tissue bank, all the cleaning is done. We also do cultures. Uh, so um, this is all done in the tissue bank. Yeah, and just off the records and off the video recording, for the people who are using it right now as a bone storage and still using it in their own hospitals, the femoral heads and so, I would like you or Manish to tell the process of how many times you need to take the culture, culture, and how do you take care and ensure that the sterility which the person from the US was MTF was also saying that it's not an infection of bacterial transmission or viral transmission has happened. So how, what all the routine process of cultures so, and what time and what blood tests need to be taken for the people who are still doing it in their clinics? So actually what happens is the moment you are uh, using unprocessed bone, obviously you have to be more careful. So uh, cultures then become important. So at the time of taking it, at that time itself, you would have to culture it. You would have to see that you are keeping it in sterile containers. Usually they use uh, double walled vessels. So it's a double container where it's sterile. And then it doesn't come out of that freezer, minus 20 or minus 80 freezer till the time you're using it. 
uh, then it's also important to close the zero diagnostic window, like I said. So it's important to do a NAT test. Okay, that's the best uh, that is available, and then perhaps it would be safer. But I still say that legally, yeah. even if you're doing this, even if you're using your freezer, you still have to register your tissue. I, I fully agree with that. Marman, uh, what about the serology aspect? Would you uh, collect the uh, yes. the serology? Yes. Is yes, all the blood tests are done. So usually the basic ones, HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. So the sampling is done at the time of the... So, you know, it's much easier when it's a living donor because those tests are usually already done when they're doing surgery. Okay, but otherwise if it's a deceased donor, then yes, the blood is collected and all this is done. And for, uh, say, for HIV, after a uh, window period, say... So, how yes, is that handled? Yes, so the window period HIV is, that's what... So if you are processing the bone, then the processes that you use handle that. Okay, then you, because then you are, you are doing, uh, you know, you are using various kinds of chemicals, you are removing all the blood and bone marrow, okay, which is where the viral repository would be. Uh, you are also sterilizing it with gamma radiation. So all that is there, okay? But if you're, that's why I said if you're using it without doing anything, then you have to be very careful. And about, what the, about the VDRL test, see, that is something which is being still asked for. And do we really need, I mean, so do, do we, we don't even do it for the patients yeah, now. So now you, actually, now we don't. The reason that VDRL test was asked for, actually, was just to give you an indication of the patient's, um, what shall I say, social habits, okay? So in, basically for the risk of HIV. So it was really an additional, more for that. So it's not really important. Question to panelist. Uh, as there is a concept of eye donation, is there any concept of limb donation? Suppose the patient has no disease and if he wants to donate his limb, and that can be used for the bone bank? Uh, so we don't call it limb donation, but we call it tissue Body. donation. So it is tissue donation, and that is legally allowed, no? So you can, have, you can have pledges, people can pledge, just as you pledge to donate your eye or skin or, uh, you know, uh, so any tissue, yes, this is, so we don't call it a limb, but we call it, you know, they, so if, if you see the rules, that's the, uh, under the TOTA Act, uh, the rules will specifically mention. So they'll mention musculoskeletal tissue, they'll mention bone, things like that. So you just take it off in terms of, yes, you would like to donate. So for that, I'd like to add, ma'am, uh, from AIMS, uh, in our center, the cadaveric donations are done. And when you are doing a cadaver in, in the, what do you call, the, with the head injury patients and you are taking a brain dead and you try to retrieve the uh, tissues, there is a provision for bones also, which can be removed for the, all the so, long so bones. Ideally, it should happen now inside the. I, I think that is what will increase the availability of allografts. Right now, we don't have it because you know the liver is taken, the yes. kidney is taken. But lungs. I'll tell you, in the last, in this year, in 2022, we took around 15. We had these brain dead donors and all. Not a single one was able. We were not able to convince the people to donate, or the, donate bones? the bones. It's is it because difficult. of the reconstruction? Because yes. we had discussed we, this we before. We need to, we need, I think, you and other people or the so senior people. Uh, so, you know, I've also, because I was uh, uh, regional director for Rotor Soto, so I've also got a little experience with the uh, organ donation. And one of the biggest problems is timing. You know, uh, the relatives are in a hurry to take the body for the funeral rites. So they feel that they've done enough by giving the organs, and organs are very dramatic, you know, because they save lives. And then nobody wants that extra time to donate the tissue. So one is, of course, reconstruction could be an issue. But even if that was not an issue, okay, this is the second big block. Um, uh, please permit me to ask a foolish question. But uh, I, I just want to know that there is a r ritual of burning the body after the death. So they give you your asthis back. So in vertebrae and in uh, there are so so many other bones. So what I understand probably is those allografts can be used. They are serving as scaffold. So once the body is burned and all the bones are also the there is no risk of infection. Can they be used as allograft by processing? No, no, you can't use. It. No, no, they they give you ja asthi manun detat. It is not ash. I have seen. Okay. See, I think it's, it's like scientific using the autoclave bone. 
हाँ इट्स 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 एक्जेक्टली इट्स ऑटो क्लेव पीपल हैव यूज्ड ऑटो क्लेव बोन एंड इट इज वेरी ब्रिटल इट डजन वर्क इन द सेम वे एस अ गुड एलोग्राफ्ट और इवन से एक्स्ट्रा कॉर्पोरल रेडिएशन एंड रीइंप्लांटेड ओके सो द इट वोंट फंक्शन it can probably be used as a filler uh, if it is processed <laughs> but we don't know yes. just one more query from my side is gamma radiation a mandatory thing for things or we can just use that counter process is not mandatory it's Any convenient radiation is it's mandatory. convenient but not man no so that's the thing about tissue banks which you know people need to understand yes. that no two tissue banks are the same okay that's why that slide that i had put earlier where ultimately what you're doing is you want it sterile and you want it immunological immunologically that's safe and you want to retain its properties how you do it that's up it's to up you to so okay so it has been left N open in the indian it's guidelines totally and open. the rules it's totally open it's totally open right thank you see most of the times our tissue harvest is not in absolutely sterile yeah, so conditions so that is the reason that's why we are doing it because we saw that radiation is leading to a lot of structural issues for us so yes. if we are able to maintain our sterility But without giving getting radiation infection rates are lower than what you get with fresh frozen allograft so our infection rates of using allograft were much lower than in the west so it's a it's a balance that you have to Fine. have so now if you don't radiate you have to risk inf infection so also what i want to say is mtf doesn't always use radiation so their grafts are not always radiated and sometimes what many banks do particularly in the west if you're taking it under sterile conditions what they do is they radiate it as soon as they get it and said so then what they do is they use very low doses of radiation so usually around so so normally we use 25 kg they would use maybe around uh, 15 kg okay and then they will do their aseptic processing and then they don't do the terminal sterile so th that's why i said variations okay any more questions from the floor before we draw this yeah uh, regarding the same in amputated patients uh, we had that 6 to 8 after 6 to 8 hours uh, usually the putrefaction process you starts you said but can the bone be still used or even after 6 8 hours the bone is also not so infection is a direct contraindication to the use of that uh, tissue as a graft so the moment the decomposition starts you have infection and you can't use that so if you ask me about time limits but yeah. up to 15 hours you can you can retrieve tissue even from a deceased donor up to 15 hours so when you have something like an amputation why would you infection when you have a open wound so you know all those sort of things then it becomes problem no so, so what so i'm asking is so what typically happens in hours is where the body has been Watch stored in the mortuary so hmm. even if it's outside manish if yeah. cold yes in a cold in indian conditions yeah. is right in even in 4 hours the decomposition starts okay so be very careful no, okay so yeah one more question uh, so what are the imp uh, implications of comorbid conditions in a uh, deceased patient uh, retrieval of bone grafts and quality of bone grafts in those like individuals uh, uh, succumbing to chronic kidney diseases who are on long term uh, yeah so his his cancer. question is inclusion criteria so look before you select say for example you've got a patient who's got a hip fracture 70 year old and you want to use that head so pre operatively you identified him as a potential donor so you have to screen him you have to take the consent you have to make sure there's no other comorbid issues now say for example if that patient was undergoing renal dialysis but without any other comorbidities would you use that head no we don't use it at bombay hospital so any systemic illness you don't use it so similarly if you've got a ra patient one side you've done the other side is pending and you're tempted should i preserve this and use it on the other side we don't so any systemic illness and it's out correct. is that correct what would you do as to yeah so, so that's the guideline but it is not required it is exactly like excluding a sarcoma patient from donating yeah. so there is if you are processing the bone and using it as a dead graft none of these are contraindications to use why should you not use a femoral head from a patient of sle or a yeah. chronic kidney disease there's absolutely no reason why you can't use it as a scapula ma'am would say there are guidelines but i think that if you are able to as you yourself said that if you are able to prevent and take care of immunogenicity yeah. and we are able to able to take care of prevention of infection any bone from anywhere is viable and we will be able to you can use it as an allograft and every bone is valuable when right. it is in short supply exactly yeah sangeet yeah if we have to see uh, lesser incisions on the iliac crest and fibula probably we need more bone banks 
and uh, our threshold for taking an incision on iliac crest is the highest anywhere in the world. Yeah. So, uh, probably with more number of bone banks and more number of donors which we should promote would reduce the morbidity which we usually have following uh, incision on iliac crest. Yeah, so that's very true. So, A is awareness. One more question I'm going to ask Dr. Astrid. So, a lot of people have asked me yesterday, if say we are at a reasonable center having 150 beds and now we want to start our own tissue bank purely as a source of getting bone, what does the paperwork entail or how difficult it is to get the permissions and how does one go about? I think uh, they have a tissue bank in Ganga, they may be able to... So, he came down here and he met her and then yes. they followed the Tata rules. So yeah, they came and trained with us actually. Yeah, but he's a registered tissue bank. Yes, yes, he's yeah, registered. So, the main the thing is you have to register with your state health. Health is a state subject. Okay, so all tissue banks have to be registered with the state health authority. So here in Mumbai, it's the Directorate of Health uh, Services. Uh, that is what is known as the appropriate authority, which the law defines, and that your state defines who that person is. So each state would have its own. So in Mumbai, I'll tell you what we do. We have the Roto Soto. We've, you know, I was involved with drawing up those guidelines. We have a checklist in terms of what is required for a bone bank, okay, or a tissue bank. You set that up, you have an inspection committee which is, uh, which is um, uh, authorized by the uh, state. They come, they inspect, they make a report, and ultimately this goes back and you get the permission from the state and that's how you get registered as a, as a board. So you have to apply to the state. So is it a laborious paperwork process and how long roughly does this whole thing? <laughs> how long it takes actually uh, just say, depends on the state. I would say that <laughs> Dhan Shekra would be the right person because she is the originator of it and he has followed that. So, so how did he with us, so Raja? I'm saying that it, it, it goes from state to state. <laughs> so he will yeah. tell us that so Tamil Nadu experience I will tell you that. my experience here in Mumbai in a nutshell. When I was at Tata Hospital, we got our registration in three months, okay? When I was helping with the Novo Tissue Bank, COVID hit. And it took us almost a year. So, you know, you just don't know how long it yeah. will happen. So, 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 it's not about just registration. I think one more thing is what are the things afterwards, like audit reports, uh, what does the government regulation require of a tissue bank to ensure that the tissue bank is following the rules and giving you quality graphs? So, the way it happens is there is nobody who comes and inspects once the tissue bank is up and running, okay? <laughs> I'm just telling you a fact, okay, but, but your registration is for five years, all right? Now, that registration has to be renewed. At the time of renewal is when they will come again and they will do an inspection in terms of whether or not to renew your registration. Yeah. So, we've got... And we do send reports. So, we do send reports in terms of how many, uh, you know, tissues are done, how many... That is sent to Roto Soto. So, your Soto, your local Soto, um, these reports have to be... I presume registered. there is a medical officer who is in charge of that. There is a yes. technician who is in charge of the bone bank who needs to look after the, all the records, camping. So, you need some specific personnel who will be specifically located for bone banking or sorry, yeah, bone bank purposes. So that also is a factor which all the clinics and the hospitals need to take care of. Because so money is also involved in keeping personnel who are going to be specifically devoted. You cannot have your OT technician who is working 24 hours in the <laughs> operation theater and also no, no. is in charge of the bone it bank. Be a job of it, the yes, it has to no, be a specific. Yeah, Vivek, office. it's like a blood bank. You yes. will need an admin person. You need one person keeping all the data. Yeah. And then you need one person maintaining standards. You need one person keeping in check what your cultures are showing. Now, one last question. You see these stored graphs. Does it have a shelf life? When you see these packages, say, for example, right now you get a graph from Tata. Right. There is nothing written on it in terms of best before. Ah, okay. So if it is a freeze-dried graft, which is stored at room temperature, then it can be, uh, the shelf life is three years, all right? If it is a frozen graft, it depends on how you store it. So if it is stored at minus 20 or minus 40, it will remain for about six months. If you store it at minus 80, then it can go on for one to two, three years also. Not an issue. So roughly six months is a good bet. Yeah, Manish? So, so it's, it's a guarantee of packaging and it's a guarantee of the sterilization. It's not that the graft yeah. is getting bad or anything like that. So the problem is what, how, how long can you guarantee that this package is sterile? Mm. 
mm. after radiation is is according to that the timing has been given so on that going a step ahead do you think the bone bank should be putting a label best before yes so now if you get grafts from robot tissue bank we have a proper insert which tells you exactly how to use the graft uh, what is the you know shelf life everything is there in that so all the details so okay. if, when you are keeping it frozen i think it is very important to see that the temperature has been maintained mm -hmm. so the moment suppose you have taken out the graft thawed it and then again put it back then that is that becomes a dangerous situation yeah And if you radiate again, you are going to cause more damage to the graft. It won't incorporate. So, if if not used, it has to be thrown. It's wasted. Okay, gentlemen. With that, I'm going to draw this session to a close. A big round of applause for all our speakers, for all of y'all coming here in the morning. This is such an informative subject, and everyone is keen to start a bank or at least have some facilities for bone grafting, even for complicated trauma cases. And it has sparked a lot of interest across all our orthopedic surgeons. So thank you one and all for coming and we'll head up for the Talwalkar Symposium. One photograph for the faculty here.